Okay. Um, so I wanted to welcome everyone today to the Irrigating Your Victory Garden. Um, this is one of our Wednesday presentations that we have as part of the Victory Garden, our Victory 2020 Garden program. Uh, if you're not part of that, that community, uh, we'll put the, the link in uh, the chat for you. If you have questions during the um, presentation, just go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll make sure that Luke gets to it. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn off my video and mute and Luke, you can go right ahead. All right, so uh, Aaron's right. Uh, what we're gonna be talking today is about uh, irrigating and watering your victory garden. Um, just as a small introduction of myself, uh, I work here in Union County, Florida as the Agricultural and Natural Resource Agent and County Extension Director. Uh, for the University of Florida uh, Extension Service. Um, so give you a little, oop, hang on one second, there we go. Give you a little background on myself. I've been with the university for uh, about five years now. Um, a lot of what I work with is uh, farmers and ranchers. Uh, so a lot of my clientele work more with raising livestock um, and also uh, large uh, crop production facilities and kind of small uh, smaller uh, gardens, um, <clears throat> but a lot of my background actually is in irrigation. Uh, before I was in extension, I was a licensed irrigation uh, contractor within uh, Northeast Florida and about uh, four or five surrounding counties. Um, and previous to that, I actually worked down in Orange County, so uh, <laughs> I see all the bunch of you down there right now. Um, and I used to work at SeaWorld in Orlando uh, as one of the, the main irrigation contractors. Uh, and then as the lead irrigation technician for Aquatica and Discovery Cove. So those are some of the theme parks that are in Orlando. Um, so a lot of my experience in, in water systems has been from small residential homes um, to some of the pictures that you see where I'm watering large scapes uh, and then large cropping systems as well. Uh, I will say that that photo on the left is not me, um, <laughs> but I have been there, done that. So we tend to get very wet and, and dirty when it comes to uh, irrigation systems. So feel free um, throughout this presentation to ask any questions you might. I'm gonna try to breeze through so we have kind of a QA and a at the end. Um, but really what I wanna talk about today is three main questions. And that's what do you have, uh, what options are out there to irrigate your gardens with? Um, are we gonna use overhead sprinklers? Are we gonna use drip systems? Um, what do you have out there that you can use to irrigate? Uh, and then really, how do you set it up? Because um, we might take a look at a, a drip system and irrigate it a little differently than we would an overhead system. And then ultimately, which I'd like to spend the most time on is when you should actually be watering. How to build a schedule so that your crops, um, your garden is, is gonna actually thrive and grow and produce like you want it to. Um, with that, in irrigation, there is no silver bullet when it comes to a specific time that a certain crop is going to need um, for how long you should water your system. There's going to be a lot of variables that go along with it. So I cannot realistically tell you if you've got a rainbird sprinkler, you need to run it for 45 minutes on your given property because there are a lot of variables between soil, weather, region, um, we've got a bunch of people from different states. Um, the, the weather climate is going to be a little different than it is down here in Florida. Um, even between where I am in kind of north central Florida to south Florida, it's going to be a bit different. Um, and then we take a look at the irrigation selection design. That plays a factor of what you're using. Um, and then also what crops you're using. Um, are we talking about lettuce versus watermelon? The water requirements are going to be quite a bit different. Um, so what we're really going to talk about is a very broad approach to a much larger um, topic of irrigating crops. Um, I'm not going to be able to hit on everything within the, the hour time that we have, uh, but hopefully if you've got questions, I'll, I'll leave a little time at the end, and then if you've got questions, we'll write them down, and I'll see if I can answer it after this at the end of the uh, uh, session. So taking a look at it, you've got three gardens right here that, that are pretty different. Um, you've got on the left photo a garden that, to be honest, is an art piece. Um, very intricate uh, design for, for the, the layout. Um, and, and it's going to be a little different to irrigate this versus the right photo, which is in straight lines. It would be very easy to set up irrigation for the right photo. 
uh, for the left photo, you're going to have to do a little more detail work in, in trying to get that watered correctly. So what I wanted to start with is kind of going through some of the options that you've got. And really, before you purchase and, and start working with the irrigation system, you want to ask yourself a couple questions. Um, really, and main one is, what are we going to irrigate? Um, are you just a single, single crop uh, that you've got a lot of corn? Uh, or do we have a lot of multiple uh, uh, crops that we're working with in our garden? Are we doing lettuce? Are we doing cucurbits? Are we doing, um, you know, kale, broccoli? You know, because each one of those is and may take a little different water than some of the others. Uh, and then what's the size and scale of, of your garden? Are we talking just a backyard patio, some, some planters that you have tomato plant uh, planted? Um, or are we talking about something in your backyard that you just decided to till up some of the grass, put in a, about a quarter of an acre of beds, and, and now you need to get it irrigated? Um, How is it laid out? Um, is that backyard laid in you know, very defined rows? Or is your garden going to be kind of organized chaos where you've got tomatoes there, tomatoes over on the other side, and you've got kind of a mixture of uh, meandering pathways throughout? So some of those you're going to have to take into a factor of how you irrigate it. Um, another big point is what is your water source? Uh, for those of you, some of you may be in urban areas where you're in a subdivision and you may be getting your water for your garden from your city water supply. Um, others may be pulling their water from a private well source. Um, so knowing some of the differences between those two, and we will go over those, um, you know, might lend you to go this way or that way. Water efficiency is something that we like to look at because we want to make sure that your irrigation is, is pretty much getting the maximum amount of water onto those vegetable uh, gardens as, we, as can be. Um, so in effect, we're looking the water that you're putting out we want to make sure that it's going from point A to point B directly to the plants and being used by the plants 100%. Um, so that's, that, that would be a good efficiency. We never really see it 100% because let's be honest, there is no system that is going to give an exact amount of water that the plants need. Um, but typically we try to get the efficiency as, as best as we can. Uh, and then what's the time and labor that you have to devote to this? Um, is hand watering cost effective uh, over putting in a drip system? Probably yes, uh, but do you have the time and labor to be able to hand water a huge garden over just a small patio garden? So taking some of those questions that you might wanna ask yourself um, before you kind of start into setting up an irrigation system. So let's kind of go through a few of the options. We just talked about hand watering. Um, this is a very cheap, you know, method of watering, um, and, and it's got some benefits. You've got really no wind drift. Your hose is probably gonna be dumping that water right where you want it. Um, so you're not gonna really get the wind carrying it away or doing anything of that nature. Um, also, it's really cheap. I mean, low maintenance, you're not gonna really have to replace things over the years. The problem we want to run into with hand watering is A, it's kind of poor uniformity, and this is a little different than efficiency that we're talking about. Think of uniformity as almost a blanket. We want to make sure that the amount of water that is hitting that tomato plant is the same amount of water that's hitting that tomato plant two feet away or 10 feet away. So we're trying to create almost a uniform coverage of water over a given area. So normally that's kind of lower when we're talking about just hand watering. Um, there's also a lot of time and labor if you are not doing just a small patio garden or a container garden. If you've got a garden this size, it's gonna take you a while to hand water it. And you're gonna be spending a couple hours doing it. So do you have that time every day or every other day to water your garden just by hand watering? Um, the other thing with, with hand watering is it is technically a high water user. We, we kind of sometimes think that, well, we're getting it right at the plant. So it's, it's using that water but the amount of flow that comes out of that, that uh, garden hose is actually pretty high. We're talking about three to 10 gallons per minute um, out of that garden hose, which is a pretty high water user. So in that sense, usually hand watering, we don't classify as very efficient as a system because you're using a lot of water. It's really not uniform. Um, so the, usually the, the, if 
you know, the, the uh, irrigation efficiency is kind of low. Um, so you've got other options out there. Overhead irrigation is definitely one of them. I think that's one of the ones we're most familiar with because is what we normally use for our uh, landscape and, and lawns. Um, low maintenance, uh, normally, you know, you might have to replace a, a sprinkler if it gets hit or clogged up or something like that. Um, these do have good uniformity. Most sprinklers are designed and manufactured and as they are installed properly, um, have a very good uniformity. So you know that um, that tomato plant right here on point A is gonna get the same amount of water as the one 10 feet away in point B. Um, the problems we have with overhead is normally because we're blowing water in the air, and if there is wind and, and heat, you're gonna get evaporation uh, and wind drift, uh, especially if we're doing it during the middle of the daytime. Um, so that's kind of one of the main problems that we have with, with overhead irrigation. They do tend to be high water users as well. You can make them lower um, by using a specific nozzle or sprinkler, um, but really the flow rate is one to four gallons per minute, and that's per sprinkler. So even if you have a smaller area and you've just got four sprinklers, one on each corner, you're using possibly 16 gallons a minute. Um, so these do tend to be high water users as well. Um, but because they're designed to have a good uniformity, the efficiency of this sort of system is a bit better than just hand watering, usually anywhere from about 60 to 85% efficient. Um, as we keep going up the line, uh, soaker hose and a lot of uh, people will use these, especially in smaller gardens and vegetable gardens. And these are great because they are classified as low flow. Um, whereas we're talking, you know, gallons per minute in the overhead irrigation, we now start talking about gallons per hour um, when we start talking about soaker hose and micro irrigation. So a lot less water given over time. Um, for your garden, but the benefit is you're putting it right at the, the soil surface and hopefully right at that plant um, uh, where the roots can pull it up. So that's the benefits of, of soaker hose. Some of the disadvantages, the uniformity is not great. You're figuring you're no longer kind of wetting a large surface in a blanket. You're just almost getting a specific line where this tube is following. So if your root system goes beyond, let's say, six inches to a feet of this tube, it's going to be dry. And so you, you've got to take that into account for how you lay um, your soaker hose out to make sure that um, as your plant grows, the root systems are going to still be able to pull up the water. Um, efficiency, because we're using low flow, it's getting it right to the soil. We don't have wind drift. We don't have ev evaporation. The efficiency of these systems is usually 80 to 90%, which is, to be honest, about as good as you can get. Um, so kind of one of the last major options that's out there is gonna be micro or drip irrigation. Uh, and there's one, some of you may be doing this, some of you may have heard of this. Um, this is very much like soaker hose, uh, but instead of having little pores throughout the entire tubing, you now have kind of emitters that are spaced about uh, 12 inches apart 18 inches apart or 24 inches apart to kind of do the same thing. Um, pretty much the same advantages and disadvantages of soaker hose. Um, main difference is gonna be the cost. So this is where you may need to look at, at the cost and how much money you have to devote to setting up a system because normally it's more expensive than you would, let's say an overhead system. Um, Cause you've got a lot more fittings, a lot more components and they are just going to be a, a, a little more pricey. So you're going to have to take that into consideration when you start trying to install an irrigation system. Um, kind of give you some specifics more on micro irrigation because there are so many options out there in the stores as you go by Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace, any of those types of stores that, that carry this, they're going to have these little fittings, these little emitters, and what does each of them mean? What, what does each of them do? So this kind of gives you a general idea of, of what the use is and kind of what are some of the, the descriptions and benefits of each one. So drip line, which you're seeing in the upper left photo, that is literally tubing where every 12 inches there's a, a manufactured emitter in it that just slowly trickles out water. Um, and you can kind of see the generalized flow rates of between drip 
line, which is what you're seeing versus drip tape, um, which is another version that we usually use for more commercial purposes. Um, these are great for row crops, long runs, or, long gar or large gardens. Um, you also have drip emitters that you can use, which is pretty much just regular tubing, doesn't have holes in it. Um, and what you're going to do is take that, that kind of circle emitter and puncture it into the tube, uh, which will kind of have that same effect of the previous emitter and just kind of trickle water out. Um, same thing, it, it's just another option. You can use these in container gardens, larger open spaced uh, plantings. <clears throat> and then you can kind of look at their micro sprays, which almost look like a mini um, sprinkler head. And they're usually on stakes. They usually kind of fan out water. Um, these ones we usually kind of designate for either um, fruit trees, um, you know, container gardens, smaller gardens, um, kind of smaller areas because they, they will use a little more water um, than some of the others and they do spray it a little more uh, than some of the others. Um, and then you can kind of look at, at some like a bubbler option which just is kind of trickling water out. Um, these typically have a uh, um, greater flow than some of the other micro uh, emitters and other things, um, but they are still classified as micro because it's low uh, and it still is technically low flow. So those are some options. When you go to the stores, you will see little packets that you can get of individual sprays and nozzles and emitters, um, or you might have this that you can look at. And they do sell kits that if you don't wanna buy the tubing, you don't wanna buy the emitters, you don't wanna buy the, the filters and everything that you need, um, most of the stores will now sell them as kits. And so here are a couple options that, that you will find either in the stores or online. Um, really what you're gonna to have to decide is what's more appropriate for your garden. Um, are you doing a big kind of open space like you see in the upper left, uh, sorry, upper right hand photo? Or do you have kind of smaller container gardens or raised beds like you do in the bottom right hand photo? Um, you notice that each of these options has different things in it. So take a look in it, make sure it's appropriate for what you want and, and what you're going to need for your area. Um, and so we'll kind of go us through some of that in the um, next section that we, we kind of go through about how to lay out, how to design one. Um, so we talked a little about water source and, and kind of what you're pulling from. These are really the main three that you might be pulling from. There are maybe one or two other options, but most likely you're either a municipal water supply, um, your city or, or you know, government is providing you water through their, their water supply, um, or you have a private well that you're pulling it up through a pump system. Um, reclaim water is another option that is out there. A lot of urban subdivisions are using reclaim to water landscape. Um, you can use this to water your vegetable garden. However, if you're not as familiar with Reclaim, it is recycled sewage water. So it is been, has been processed and purified to a certain extent, but not to the point where it can be used as drinking water. So there are still some possibilities of contaminants, bacteria um, that can be within that water. So this is why we don't want to use it for drinking purposes. If you are using overhead irrigation for your vegetables, I don't recommend reclaim. If you can convert it to drip irrigation where it's getting on the soil and not getting on the fruits, that is, is acceptable. Um, in any case, I do recommend washing your fruit, especially if you're using reclaim water afterwards, um, just to be on the precautionary side. If you're also using- hey, Luke. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just wanted to, to just fill, uh, jump in there on that reclaimed. Um, just EPA guidelines, if you are using reclaimed water, um, you know, you can use it, like you were saying, it's not the best thing, but um, any fruit where you're eating the skin, that's where you really want to be careful with it um, if you're not peeling it, for instance, um, and they don't recommend the use of reclaimed for that. So you might want to look into like a, um, a rain barrel system or cistern or something like that instead. Yeah. And so that's, that's a very good point is, again, just with that fruit production, um, you know, so anything, tomatoes, blueberries, all that sort of stuff, we just, we just want to make sure. Uh, but it is an option that you can use. Uh, not one we recommend, but 
it is uh, there as an option. Um, when we start getting into reclaim private well, it is also kind of more essential, especially if you're using drip, that your system needs to be filtered. Um, there are particulates when we're talking about minerals, uh, sand, iron, that can clog up uh, drip emitters or micro emitters because they're a much smaller opening than you would have a sprinkler. Um, so we do generally recommend about a 200 mesh filter be used. Um, these are some options that you can use uh, that you might have to order a 200 mesh filter. But you can kind of see, um, you know, the size of particles that we're trying to collect out of that filtration that we need to out of micro irrigation. So, I mean, we're collecting beach sand, fine sand, sediment, minerals, um, and even rust flakes. So that's kind of what we want to uh, filter out out of a micro irrigation system so it does not clog up. Um, other components that you will need to look into, backflow is one of them. And this is kind of like what Aaron was saying, this is more as a precautionary um, uh, uh, safety concern. Most of you may have this on your residential homes for, especially if you're on a city water supply. Um, this device is really there to protect the water source or your home water from having backflow issues and contamination issues uh, from other sources. So if you've got an irrigation system that's connected to your house line, this thing is there to prevent your irrigation water from flowing backwards into your house water supply or back into the city lines or back in the aquifer, depending on what system you're looking at. Um, so this is really kind of one of those necessity things for a health safety issue. Some areas, some counties actually require this by coding, some do not. Um, but especially, you know, when we're talking about um, irrigation and outside, you can get bacteria within those irrigation lines. So it's probably a good thing to have a backflow of some nature um, on your system if you're installing one. Your vegetable gardens can be set up with an automatic controller too. I mean, that's not a bad thing. Um, one difference that we usually give with vegetable production versus let's say landscape or, or um, turf usually we can kind of set a very specific schedule on a season and with landscape and we just have to adjust it. With vegetables, there is a very, very specific um, amount of water as they produce and grow and fruit and mature that we wanna make sure that we're getting. So you do have to pay a little more attention to adjusting your, your schedule based on your controller if we're talking about vegetable production. Um, you also may still need to add a rain sensor. In Florida, it is a uh, Florida statute that every automatic system has to have a rain shutoff device. Um, depending on if you're in a different state or even a different country, this may or may not be similar. So take a look at your local coding and state coding. Um, but in Florida, if you've got an automatic system, it's got to have a rain sensor attached to it. So other options, and, and Aaron made a comment on it, is about a rain barrel or rain harvesting. Um, great option to do for small vegetable gardens, potted um, you know, patio uh, container plants. If you've got a large size garden, this is probably not gonna be um, something that will help you out dramatically. Uh, when we're talking about the pressure that is needed to push out that water, um, a rain barrel itself is probably not a, a great option. You need a pump to be added to push it uh, because by itself, if you just open up a valve at the bottom, you're only gonna get about less than two PSI worth of pressure to be able to push that water out, which is not gonna get you even a garden hose um, you know, pressure. So I just want to kind of give this comparison. If we're looking at uh, out of the park, really weird, train tank car and we put it vertical, that gives us enough vertical distance where we have gravity pushing down on it to give us about 24 PSI, which you could run an irrigation system off that. Um, but again, if you're just doing a small patio, rain barrel is gonna be perfectly great. You also can kind of see based on your surface area of a roof, how much water you can get off of a roof uh, when we're talking about water versus how much your rain barrel can hold. So, um, but it, it's a great option to do for small uh, container gardens in small areas. Um, so going to the next section, we talked about some of the options that are out there. 
Now let's get into, okay, I wanna do drip irrigation. How do I set that up? Um, and it's really gonna dictate by what your garden is. Do you have those uniform rows? You have curving rows. Um, what's your water source? Uh, how, how big is this area? How much drip tubing? How many sprinklers am I gonna need for this whole surface area of your garden? And then also take into account um, what crops you're using. Are you growing corn? Um, if you're using overhead irrigation, you're gonna have to get it above that corn. Um, so, I mean, you're gonna have to set those sprinklers up to six, seven feet high to get over that corn if you're using overhead irrigation. So it might be better to use drip in that sense so you get it at the root zone. Uh, but just realizing some of the crops that you're growing, you may wanna use one or the other. Um, and then possible expansion. So um, we have a garden and it continually expands over and over again. And so, you know, you take a set up a specific system for your garden and then by next season, you want to add more and more. So realize that you might have to also expand your irrigation system over time. Um, so some of the general design principles that we, we like to see, really pressure and flow are driving forces when it comes to setting up an irrigation system. If you've got a very small patio or a small garden, you're probably not gonna to need to worry about this too much. Um, but when we're talking about um, larger areas, we wanna make sure that the water um, outputs, and I think I got that backwards on there, do not exceed the water inputs. Um, so what you're trying to push out of the system and get the water on the crops cannot exceed what you've got available from your water source. So let's take this example of a pump which is going to do a max flow of 16 gallons per minute. Um, so you figure every minute this thing's pushing out 16 gallons of water. Um, and in your garden you've got five sprinklers each doing three gallons a minute so you're trying to push out 15 gallons a minute. This is fine. Your, your amount that you're asking it to put out is pretty equal to what it can handle. Um, but if we go to uh, the far end and let's say your garden's under drought conditions, you don't know what's going on, so you decide to add more sprinklers to it, and now you add eight, so now you're trying to push out 24 gallons per minute, but your pump can only handle 16 gallons per minute. That's where we run into a lot of low pressure issues, which is what you're seeing in the upper right hand corner. So this is what we don't want. We want the range of what your outputs are to be equal or less than your inputs, what you can provide. But on the flip side, let's say you just install one sprinkler, do full 360 and that's all you got. Um, now you're really kind of undersized doing it and your system is trying to push out 16 gallons a minute, but you're only being able to push out three or four gallons a minute. If you're on a pumping system, this is gonna create some problems, but you're also gonna create a lot of high pressure, which is what you're kind of seeing on the bottom right hand corner, which creates a lot of misting. Um, and it, it's not good for that uniformity. Neither one of those two photos is good for uniformity. Um, we also wanna take a look at how you lay out your drip lines or your sprinklers to make sure that they are uniform, they are all kind of equal in what the um, output that gallons per minute is and that pressure is. So on the right Hello. row, the, yes ma'am. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you and you may get to this, but how, where do we find the pump? Like the pump, um, if you go back that, to that one slide, the, um, the number for the pump, where would we find that at? Or are you gonna tell us how? So, the, no, that's a good question. So, and, and it depends on where your well is, but some have submersible pumps, which literally the pump is in the well underground. Um, so if you don't have documentation on that, it's a little harder to figure out what your flow rate, what your max capacity is. If it's above ground, you should have something that looks very similar to that picture. That one's a stay right. Um, it, it could be a number of others. But what you will have to do, if you don't have the paperwork, the, the manual that goes with it, you can look online. Um, there are some uh, serial numbers on those pumps um, that you can look up to find out the, the manual um, and they can spit you out a PDF manual that should give you the max flow rate of what you can do. 
um, and the pressure that these operate at. So now it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so back to this, we want the lines, especially the drip lines, to kind of be uniform. And, and when I look at the most left depiction uh, in that green box, that's kind of what we want. We want it to almost be tree form, um, where each sprinkler probably has the same distance from the source and you're, you're almost trying to create an equilibrium in the system. Whereas if you go to the right box, which is labeled wrong, um, that, that left photo, which just follows a single line around, the pressure at that first circle, which is gonna be a sprinkler, is going to be different than what is at the end point uh, uh, sprinkler. Um, and so you see some variation on efficiency and uniformity. So we don't really want it to look like that. And I couldn't find a vegetable photo, but this is kind of what happens if, <clears throat> excuse me, sprinklers or emitters aren't spaced right, where you get these dead areas um, that that sprinkler isn't able to hit. And so if they're not spaced close enough where one sprinkler is hitting to the next, um, or one emitter is not hitting to the next and wetting a pattern, um, and, and getting uniform coverage, then you're going to have certain plants that will just not get as much water as, as others. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a photo in just a second, actually right here. So what we also want is to make sure that, you know, you don't over-engineer this or under-engineer this. And so the left photo, it's a great depiction of square foot gardening. Um, I typically wouldn't recommend using the irrigation lines to designate your square foot gardening though. Um, there are a lot cheaper ways like yarn to do it. Uh, so this specific method, how he did it, that's all drip line. So you've got emitters that are um, pouring out water out of that at, uh, at some points. Um, each of those that, that probably has about 50 some odd fittings that you're gonna have to purchase and put in and the labor that would, would it must have taken to cut those equally and space them all apart, put them all together, when you could have done something differently and run one line up the center between both those boxes and then just made that kind of tree form look uh, with the drip tubing, you probably would have only had to purchase 10 fittings um, and, and save yourself some money. So we also want, especially on drip, remember earlier I said drip lines usually come in 12 inch, 18 inch, and 24 inch spacing for their emitter. Um, so this is a, a, a depiction of something that, that may not work for this person uh, because they either use the 18 inch um, or, or their emitter spacing is just not appropriate for the crop that they've got. Uh, they're gonna have to run this system for a very long time to get that wetting pattern to get all those crops and all those plants. Um, so just make sure when you're buying the product, if you've got smaller plants, lettuce, carrots, radishes, you're either gonna have to buy the 12 inch drip tubing or you might wanna do something like a micro spray that's gonna get a little more surface area. Um, a lot of times I get asked, well, what, what's a proper design for drip lines? Uh, and which side of the plant do I put my drip on? Um, really? It doesn't matter too much if, if we're doing double drip lines versus single. Um, just realize you are, if you're doing two lines on either side of the plant, you are doubling your water output. So when you go into scheduling, just realize that and take that into account that based on um, both those lines, you're doubling your water. So you're gonna have to adjust that in the time that you run it. If you're just running a single line, um, it really doesn't matter on what side you run the drip line. The only exception I usually give is if you're in an area that has elevation change. So if you've got a slope, put it on the higher end of the slope so that gravity will pull it down to that plant. If it's on the lower end, it's gonna pull it away from that plant and that plant's gonna have a harder time getting it. Um, but beyond that, it, it really, I've seen a lot of different variations. You've got a lot of row crops here, lines, but on the bottom right, you've just got pretty much a spaghetti um, uh, design for for drip tubing, which is perfectly fine. You're getting water to each plant and then really that's what matters. Um, and usually that's one of two things. We're getting water to the plant and really I want to make sure it's the cheapest option that, that you can do. Um, so if you've got raised planters, this is an option. Uh, drip is great for, for this. You could also do micro sprays instead. 
Um, this is a bet I, I helped the school do a couple of years back. Um, I think the kids got a little overzealous with the amount of lines. Um, really, I, I, if I remember, they're spaced about every four inches. These could have been spaced about every eight to 12 inches and you could have minimized the amount of tubing that you use, but this would be a perfect example of what you could do for a raised uh, planter bed. And then you've got this, this is another option. Um, this one's pretty much just kind of a very eclectic bed, um, you know, and, and so you've got tomatoes here. On the left side, you've got tomatoes at the back of the property, you've got kale here, you've got carrots here. Um, so if you're one of more of these, drip is a possibility. Um, you're gonna have to spend a little more labor in getting it to the beds. This one was done with just overhead. You can kind of see the sprinklers along the fence uh, line on rising on risers. Um, so this one just waters the whole area. And I know one of the main reasons that that was done was because these beds kind of rotated and moved. Um, you know, the, the beds kind of shifted, the pathway shifted. So every season you're gonna have to relocate all your drip lines. Um, so this, which isn't an option, but this would be another option that you could do. All right, any questions so far, Erin? Are we, we doing good on time? You're doing great, thanks. We're gonna hold okay. the questions until the end. Okay, great. Because um, this is really where we start working with uh, scheduling, and I know that's where we have a, pro a lot of problems as gardeners. Um, my, my tomato's not looking good. I now have cracked tomatoes. Why did it crack? Um, why do my plants look wilty? Uh, in the middle of the daytime. So this should help kind of guide you a bit through some of the reasons where we, we tend to fall short on scheduling. Um, and a lot of it is going to be dependent on several questions. Um, soil content is really a key factor when we're talking about um, irrigation and scheduling water systems. Um, do you have sandy soil? Is your makeup more clay? Is it more lay, uh, loamy? Um, you know, so those are all really good questions to know or answers to know to be able to figure out how and when you need to water. Um, weather patterns, rainfall, um, we need to take these into account when we're setting up our, our irrigation schedule. Um, what system do you have and what's the output? Is it putting out too much water? Do I somehow have to break that up into multiple times? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, what does the crop need? Um, crop individual crops when we're talking about species, and then even crop maturity. At what stage do you need to change your watering regime um, to be able to provide enough water for that crop? So when we're talking about scheduling, <coughs> um, really a, on the lower kind of diagram with the flowers, what we want is the plants to have available water, which is kind of on the middle of the scale. Um, and really watering plants is a balancing act. Too little, they die. Too much, they die. And so I usually like to kind of make an analogy of a sponge when we're, we're kind of talking about this, where when we're using a sponge to watch our dishes, we, what do we do? We probably saturate it, we run it under the thing, it starts dribbling out water. Um, that's where we're at the saturation part. That sponge is full, it's draining water out of it, it cannot hold anymore. And so you can think of the soil in that context of saturation point. Um, it's trying to drain out because it, it, it just can't hold anymore. Um, this is not a good area for plants. Um, this is where they stand in water and, and where too much water is a bad thing as well. Um, so as we start going up the scale, when we're talking about that sponge, you kind of wring it out um, it's still moist, it's still holding water, but it's no longer draining it out. And so that's really that, that field capacity and that, that time when it's available to the plant. That's where we kind of want the soil to be um, and have you know, enough water for the plants to, to actually pull up. When you set that sponge aside, it starts drying out. Um, we start to get to the wilting point and then ultimately once it's dry, it, it's too, surpassed uh, the, the permanent wilting point, which is pretty much there's no more water in that sponge or that soil for the plant to use and it dies. So really when, when we're talking about water, we want it to be kind of towards that middle. We need that moisture there for that plant to use, but we don't want it to be standing in the water, but we also don't want it to dry out too quickly. 
um, when we're talking about commercial producers, they are using some real-time data, um, uh, you know, with ET evapotranspiration. They are using rain sensors to guide them, and this is a chart that that pretty much shows that balancing act of they want to stay within a very specific range where it's not too dry, not too wet. Um, it's much harder for us as homeowners and, and small gardeners to do that. We don't have rain sensors, um, and so there are certain methods that you can do um, just by looking at it as my plants under drought. Okay, now I know it's time to water. Um, crop water demand is what we usually use on bigger systems um, where we're using some, some measurements, some data, um, devices to figure out a scheduling pattern. Um, what we'll talk about today is more a systemic method, which is we're talking about time and volume. We don't go over certain parameters like soil and weather, but it should kind of give you an idea of what to look for. Um, really, first off, though, you do need to know about your soil. I'm not really going to go into it. I think you guys, have, if you haven't um, learned about soils, this kind of gives you a little idea. But drainage, we know in soil and sandy soil, it's going to drain a lot quicker and faster than it would if it's clay-based or even loam-based. And so kind of knowing how quickly it drains out should give you an idea of how often you need to water. Um, weather patterns are, are really going to be key. Is your area seasonally um, and regionally, do you have a lot of rainfall that you may not need to water as much? Um, are you under drought conditions? Um, you know, so U.S. Drought Monitor System is a, a good place if you're trying to find out in the United States, um, I, and I'm sorry, UK, I'm, I'm assuming you probably have some resources like this that would be for your area as well. Um, if, if you're in the state of Florida, we also have the Florida Automated Weather Network, uh, FAWN, that you can look at too, that gives you good data, um, soil temperature, how hot is it outside at different um, uh, heights through the um, uh, air, rain patterns, precipitation. So you can find out a lot of good information to help you create a schedule going forward. Um, you can also use stuff like this. Um, regionally, we do have um, charts and information like this, where it's we know different crops are going to use different amounts of water, have different amounts of drought resistance versus others. So certain plants like uh, lettuce, radishes, uh, spinach, in the grand scheme of things, yes, they require water, but it's going to definitely be a, a lot less water needs than we would a watermelon would do. Our fruit's a lot bigger with watermelon. You're, you're trying to create a much bigger baby, and you're going to need more nutrients and more water to sustain that baby. Um, so that you can use this chart as kind of a guideline. Um, certain other areas in the United States, this may not it, it may fluctuate, but uh, this is more typical for Florida and what we see. And then some of those critical stages when we're talking about fruit set uh, versus some plants, they, it doesn't matter when, they just need continual uh, monitoring of water. So other kind of scheduling factors that, that you really wanna take into consideration, if you can, watering in the early morning is, is probably still one of the best times that we recommend um, we don't want you watering during the day because of that heat, that wind, the evaporation and wind drift issue. We, we want um, that water to be in that, that garden and really get to the plants that you need it to. Um, watering late at night also can bring in some disease and leaf spot issues that we also don't want to see. Um, so in early mornings, probably still one of the you know, best times to water. Uh, watering longer periods of time but less frequent is also still, even with vegetables, um, probably going to be a, a, you know, one of those recommended practices. It's going to encourage those roots to kind of go down deeper um, and grow better. Um, if the roots just stay at the surface, uh, you've got that heat and, and sun will bake off and evaporate some of the, the moisture that's in the top where the roots are. Um, and, and damage some of the plants. We want it to really kind of get down more deeper in the soil. Um, if you're in sandy soils, Florida, um, you may need to think about watering in different times and split applications. So we'll go through a process shortly that talks about you may need to water, you know, 70 uh, minutes 
uh, in a week. And so you don't want to just do that all in one shot because most of that will probably go way further down than the root systems than what we wanted. So you may have to break that up. Even in a day, you may have to water once in the mid morning, once uh, in the later afternoon. Um, mulching is still a really good practice for moisture retention. And so that reduces the amount of water that we need to give it. Um, so whether you're using pine straw or hay, um, you know, whatever you're using as a mulching agent, uh, we really do recommend mulching those, those beds. Um, some of us may still have to follow local water restrictions. Um, if we're talking local in Florida, drip irrigation, micro irrigation, even reclaimed water usually falls outside of our, our local water restrictions. Um, but if you're not in Florida and then in certain parameters, you may have to follow water and restrictions. So just, um, you know, uh, contact your local government, your state agencies, um, they may have different requirements. So we, we've talked a lot about a lot of factors um, that go into scheduling. So how do we actually schedule? So this is what we're going to be talking about the rest of the time is we know as a principle that plants are going to need one to two inches of water per week um, to grow and thrive. This is this comes with a caveat, which we'll talk in a few minutes, um, but we know that's that's a general guideline that we give. Um, based on that guideline, we can actually create you a schedule for irrigation. So we know one inch of water in a given thousand square feet, you're gonna to need to dump 620 gallons of water over that thousand square feet to give you one inch of water. So all those numbers downwards are from a one inch of water standpoint, not a two inches. So if you feel you need two inches, just double that time or th that amount of gallons. Um, so if we're talking one square foot of surface area, it's gonna be 0.624 gallons of water that you're going to need to put on that per week to get you one inch of, of water. Um, so we can kind of take a look at that and based on your system, we can kind of build you a, a water schedule. So first thing we need to know is how big is your garden? Um, easiest thing hopefully is a rectangle, length times width. Um, that should give you your full square footage, the, the surface area of that garden. If it's not a rectangle, you might have to go back to high school math and, and kind of figure out um, if it's a circle, what the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the surface area of your garden, <coughs> excuse me, is gonna be. Um, once we have that, we can use that formula based on one square foot and give you a total amount of square foot, that uh, to, a total amount of gallons that your garden is gonna need per week based on that one inch of water per week recommendation. Um, how you figure that out with your system, it's going to be a little different. I kind of gave you a couple ideas if you're using sprinklers versus micro emitters versus drip line. You can kind of use one of these three pathways to figure it out. If it's drip line, you're going to have to take the total linear footage, how much tubing you have of, of your drip line, um, figure out the distance of your emitter. So whether you're using that 12 inch spacing, 18 or 24, um, divide it to get your total number of emitters, um, times it by the water flow of each emitter, and usually that's in gallons per hour. Um, and then we want to put it in gallons per minute, so you divide that by 60 to get you gallons per minute. Uh, and that should give you your water output in gallons per minute of your drip line system. Hopefully I didn't lose anyone there. Um, you can answer some of the questions that you might have in the, the Q&A section. Um, but this will give you a kind of a clear picture of how much water your system puts out uh, per minute. Um, and <clears throat> then we can build you based on how much water your needs, uh, how much water your garden needs versus what your system can put out. Um, and then we just divide them to figure out the time you need to run your system in minutes to apply the total gallons that you need on a given week for one inch of water. So this can kind of start to give you an idea of what you need to do for a watering schedule. So I did want to give you at least an example to kind of walk you through that uh, very quickly. So we've got a rectangle garden right here, 35 feet by 50 feet. So we got 1,750 square feet worth of surface area. 
we know we've got five sprinklers um, uh, that are there. Um, and so each of those sprinklers puts out three gallons per minute. So our sprinkler system is gonna be putting out 15 gallons per minute. Um, and so we know that we can build that system. And through that, that calculation, we know this system is going to put out or need to run for 73 minutes per week. Um, now, granted, that is going to be, um, you know, per week at the one inch of recommended uh, recommendation rate. The problem that we have with that, that's one inch of water per week. This system does, or this calculation really does not take into other scheduling aspects like regional difference, uh, weather patterns, soil structure, crop species, crop maturity, or the efficiency of your irrigation system. So it gives you a very good baseline of what you need. And that's why there is a one to two inches of, of recommended rate. Um, so it's not a great method, it's not a silver bullet, but it should give you a, a kind of baseline of what you need to use for your watering schedule. There are other options that you have available. Um, there are mobile apps that you can get and use. Um, this one is one that's put out for Florida uh, and you have specific applications for vegetable production, blueberry irrigation. Um, you have to know some of the specifics on your region and your um, irrigation system. You'll put in a little information, it will ask a little information, but ultimately it will spit out you a, 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 a schedule that you can use for your vegetable garden. Um, I know that's a lot to go over um, in such a short time. Normally I teach a lot of this in about two to four hour classes. Uh, and we, we went through a lot in you know, the, the last you know, 40 minutes to an hour or so. Um, really take home messages are what you want to use and how you're gonna use it are really gonna be affected by your garden design, your crop selection and your available water source. Um, also, when and how often you have to water is really going to be dependent on several factors, your soil composition, crop maturity, and other environmental factors. Um, but hopefully this kind of gave you an idea of what you may need to do for watering um, and, and kind of gave you what you might want to use or maybe what you're using already. Um, so that's really all I've got for now. I put a couple of uh, you know, resources that you can also look at kind of go a little more in depth on, on some of the scheduling aspects. Um, but thank you for listening and, and hopefully, I mean, at this point, I'll open it up for questions. Okay, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, we have a couple that had come in. Um, so the first one is, what is the best way to provide a larger scale system on municipal water source on the scale of 250 plus micro spray emitters? Okay, so <clears throat> are, you, are you looking, um, what, what is the problem with using your municipal water supply? Are we seeing low pressure or are we talking um, water savings? Uh, because I'm, I'm sure that's, you know, if that's on your municipal water supply, that's probably eating from your house fed and you're paying for that water. Um, so it, it may be where you're using a substantial amount of water. Um, is, is that kind of what you're... We'll see if they, we'll see if they reply. Um, for some other reason, I can't get the chat um, box up, so I can't see. Okay. The next question was, how much improvement is there in aero emitters? Um, so like the, the drip type emitters um, that you use for the gardening. And it doesn't say kind of when, but it just says how much improvement is there. I don't know that they've changed in a couple of years. <laughs> Luke, you might have more the, info on that. Um, yeah, if we're talking about the actual um, manufacturing, if like there's been improvements down through the years, um, they've gotten a, a little better, um, you know, down from, you know, the 60s and 70s upwards to now. Uh, they don't clog as much. Um, they're a little more efficient and then the spray patterns, a lot of it also they are now including with pressure compensating um, so that you're not, if, if you've got um, high water pressure, there's a pressure compensator that you can add to it. 
to reduce that so you don't get misting. Um, if we're talking about from uh, improvement, if we're talking from sprinklers, there, there's a good uh, uh, amount of improvement from overhead irrigation when we're talking about the water efficiency, how well it's being used um, and getting to the plants and, and ultimately the soil contact is really where we want it to be. Um, so from overhead irrigation, there is definitely an improvement, but if you're talking about from um, the actual manufacturing of, of the sprays and, and nozzles, they haven't changed drastically, but they have seen improvements uh, down through the years. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's the only other questions we had that are posted right now. Um, okay. We will post these, uh, this video on our um, Victory um, 2020 community page, the, where we have the archived uh, from the Wednesday classes. If you do want the PowerPoint as well, um, I think we'll post it in the, um, the Canvas course if you're a member there. Um, if not, email uh, Luke or myself and we can get that to you. Uh, I think with some of the, the scheduling and calculations, they might want the actual document sure. if you're okay yeah. with that. And, and I'll be more than happy to uh, help anyone out that I can, um, you know, absolutely. All right, All right we're right at 12 o'clock, so that's awesome. All right. Yeah, if you good. have any questions, Luke, do you have anything else? We want to thank you very much yeah. for um, that very informative session. Thank you, everyone.